You put yourself in this sort of zen state, even though this is a bizarre experience for most people. Yeah. Well, the tank in, in, in that, it's so alien that this, this, this time where your body doesn't move at all is so bizarre to you. Like we're, we're constantly shifting our weight, even when we sleep, we're moving around, we're reacting to gravity, we're reacting to the pillow on our neck. You know, you're always, there's, there's input that's coming in. It's the only time where there's no input. And yeah. it's so hard to just manage that. Yeah. It's so hard to just relax because you'll start coming up with fake things like my dick itch is fucked. Should I itch my dick? <laughs> and you'll start thinking like I can just itch my dick. Then I'm gonna get salty water on my dick, and then it's gonna itch some more. It takes a long time. It takes a bunch of different uses till you get to where, like when I go in that thing, that's my home, man. I'm so used to that thing. I close that door. I lie back and I go, let's find out what's up. Let's find out what's up. Let's see what's up. And I never go in sober anymore. I'm always blitzed when I get in there because I just feel like marijuana, um, especially high doses, make you very, very sensitive. Very sensitive and it makes you very, uh, you, you, you contemplate things you might not have contemplated. My mind is always racing in a million different directions thinking about things and there's nothing like the isolation tank to enhance that because when you have nothing coming into your, your mind from the body, the body is sending no signals. Like all of a sudden you have radio silence and the mind is on its own. The mind without any sensory input is fucking super powered, man, in a way that it's very difficult to describe because nobody ever experiences it. It's the only environment like that in the world where there's nothing coming in. And it is beyond bizarre to me that more people aren't aware of this fucking thing. I mean, I I've been talking about it for years. We put videos up about it and people come to me about it and they ask me like, dude, tell me about the isolation tag. I'm like, how could I possibly be an expert in this fucking thing? All right, all I am is just some dude who has one who uses it. How are there not scientists that are studying the benefits of this shit and pushing it to everyone as stress relief, as a, a clarity device, as a, a device for objective reasoning and thinking and creativity? Every artist should have one. Every athlete should have one. Every fighter should have one. Anybody where you need deep, intense thought without distraction, you don't even fucking know what that is until you get in that isolation tank. The more clear your image of God, the less powerful it is, because you're clinging to it. The more it's an idol. But voiding it completely isn't going to turn it into what you think of as void. What would you think of as void? Being lost in a fog so that it's white all around and you can't see in any direction. Being in the darkness or the color of your head as perceived by your eyes. That's probably the best illustration that we would think of as the void. Because it isn't black and it isn't white, it isn't anything. But that's still not the void. Take the lesson from the head. How does your head look to your eyes? Well, I tell you, it looks like what you see out in front of you, because all that you see out in front of you is how you feel inside your head. So it's the same with this. And so, for this reason, the great sixth patriarch, Huaynang, in China, said that it was a great mistake for those who were practicing Buddhist meditation to try to make their minds empty. And a lot of people tried to do that. They sat down and tried to have no thoughts whatever in their minds. And not only no thoughts, but no sense experiences. So they'd close their eyes, they'd plug up their ears, and uh, generally go in for sensory deprivation. Well, sensory deprivation, if you know how to handle it, can be quite interesting. It'll have the same sort of results as uh, taking LSD or something like that. And there are special labs made nowadays where you can be sensorily deprived to an amazing degree. But if you're a 
sort of a, a good yogi, this doesn't bother you at all, send some people crazy. But if you dig this world, uh, you can have a marvelous time in a sensory deprivation scene. Also, especially if they get you into a condition of weightlessness. Skin divers going down below uh, a certain number of feet, I don't know exactly how far it is, but get a sense of weightlessness. And at the same time, this deprives them of every sense of responsibility. They become alarmingly happy. And they have been known to simply take off their masks and offer them to a fish. And of course, they then drown. So if you skin dive and you, keep, you have to keep your eye on the time, you have to have a water watch or a friend who's got a string attached to you. If you go down that far, and at a certain specific time, you know you have got to get back. However happy you feel, and however much inclined to uh, say, survival, survival, what the hell's the point of that? <laughs> and this is happening to the men who go out into space. They will increasingly find that they have to have automatic controls to bring them back. Quite aside that they can't change in any way from the spaceship. Now, isn't that interesting? Can you become weightless here? I said a little while ago that the person who really accepts transience begins to feel weightless. When Suzuki was asked, what is it like to have experienced Satori, enlightenment, he said, it's just like ordinary everyday experience, but about two inches off the ground. Zhuangzi, the Taoist, said, it is easy enough to stand still. The difficulty is to walk without touching the ground. Now, why do you feel so heavy? It isn't just a matter of gravitation and weight. It is that you are feel that you are carrying your body around. So there is a koan in Zen Buddhism. Who is it that carries this corpse around? So when you feel it, we, common speech expresses this all the time. Life is a drag. <laughs> I feel I'm just dragging myself around. My body is a burden to me. To whom? To whom? That's the question. You see? And when there is no body left for whom the body can be a burden, the body isn't a burden. But so long as you fight it, it is. So then, when there is nobody left to resist the thing that we call change, which is simply another word for life, and when we dispel the illusion that we think our thoughts, instead of being just a stream of thoughts, and that we feel our feelings instead of being just feelings, it's like saying, you know, to feel the feelings is a redundant expression. It's like saying, actually, I hear sounds, for there are no sounds which are not heard. Hearing is sound. Seeing is sight. You don't see sights. Sightseeing is a ridiculous word. You could just say either sighting or seeing one or the other, but sightseeing is nonsense. So we keep though doubling our words, and this doubling is comparable to oscillation in an electrical system where there's too much feedback, where you remember in the old-fashioned telephone where the receiver was separate from the, from the mouthpiece, the transmitter. Uh, if you wanted to annoy someone who was abusing you on the telephone, you could make them listen to themselves by putting the receiver to the mouthpiece. But it actually didn't have that effect. It set up oscillation. It started to howl. It could be very, very hard on the ears. The same way, if you turn a television camera at the monitor, that is to say, the television set in the studio, the whole thing will start to jiggle. 
the visual picture will be of oscillation. Da 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 like that. And the same thing happens here. When you get to think that you think your thoughts, the you standing aside the thoughts has the same sort of consequence as seeing double. And then you think, can I observe the thinker thinking the thoughts? Or, I am worried, and I ought not to worry, but because I can't stop worrying, I'm worried because I worry. And you see where that could lead to. It leads to exactly the same situation that happens in the telephone, and that is what we call anxiety, trembling. But this discipline that we're talking about of Nagarjuna's abolishes anxiety because you discover that no amount of anxiety makes any difference to anything that's going to happen. In other words, from the first standpoint, the worst is going to happen. You're all going to die. And don't just put it off in the back of your mind and say, I'll consider that later. <laughs> it's the most important thing to consider now because it enables you, it is the mercy of nature because it's going to enable you to let go and not defend yourself all the time. Waste all the energies.